Super excited to welcome you to Woke Up Like This. We have four panelists today. I'm going to introduce everybody up front, so you're going to hear less of me during the middle of the session. Um, our first presenter is Brittany Summit Gill. She's a PhD candidate at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a regular contribu contributor to the Society Pages Bor blog, not Borg. I cannot read anymore. I had a baby and I'm really dumb now. <laughs> um, her work has also appeared in Real Life Magazine, The New Inquiry, and Refinery29. She writes about media and the politics of identity. Our next presenter is Sarah Reynas. She is a social media theorist and strategist. Currently, she is working towards her master's in media, culture, and communication at NYU, and she loves memes. Our next presenter will be Leah Schrager. She's an artist who works between the web and NYC. In her work, she photographs, appears in, augments, and markets her own image. She founded Naked Therapy, co-curated the Female Positive Body Anxiety.com exhibition, and is currently engaged in the celebrity's art practice project, Ona. And our last presenter is Sofia Glebnova. I just butchered your last name. I tried Glebovna. Uh, is a young Moscow-born and Berlin-based researcher and web artist. Studying movie, theater studies, and philosophy, her prominent fields of research include remediation, dis digital performance, and cyberfeminism. Her research process is always accompanied by the creation of web-based artworks. So with that, welcome to panel. Okay. Hey, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about a fashion app game called Covet and its attempt to introduce diversity into the game um, and the successes and failures, mostly failures, of that attempt. This, is, this presentation will be mostly a critique of the ideology of voting and choice. It's very pervasive, obviously, in the society, as well as on platforms that rely on voting as a, as a metric, as a mode of quantification. And I'll be looking at how this dynamic played out on Covet and ultimately how Covet failed to uh, effectively acknowledge this as both a design problem as well as a systemic societal problem. My slide showing up all right? You guys see him? All right. Um, so when you search for the essay that I wrote on this topic back in 2015, the first hit on Google is somebody who posted it on Tumblr and said, can you imagine being this worked up over a fashion app? <laughs> So um, the like insecure intellectual in me wants to explain to you why I think this is important. Most of my scholarship is based in cultural studies, which is the study of power and politics in everyday life. So I see this specific case study as kind of a bridge between uh, you know, the relationships between structures of violence at a social level and then how those structure, structures reflect and perpetuate uh, inequalities throughout our everyday life. So Covet is a paper doll style game in which users enter challenges, uh, they create fashion ensembles, and then they compete against other users in head-to-head -head voting to win prizes. The game boasts, the game boasts over a million players from all around the world, and ultimately how, the, how the, the gameplay works is you select from a list of challenges, you meet those, that challenge's requirements, which might be wearing a certain pair of boots or wearing a designer necklace. You can select from different... Uh, Different looks for your models, such as skin tone, makeup, hairstyle, obviously different um, clothing and accessories. And then you compete in head-to-head -head voting to receive a score on your look. And how well you do depend, uh, determines what kinds of prizes you win. So here you can see this is a pretty high-scoring look, and I received two garments and an um, in-game currency package. So prizes from challenges are key to leveling up and progressing in the game. Just want to give you a, a sense of what head-to-head -head voting looks like. So this is the before and after. You see one model versus another model, and then afterwards you can see how they scored. And ultimately, this voting model resulted in a high degree of racial bias. Uh, this is an example from the top looks. It's all washed out. I don't know why. Sorry about that. But hey, it makes it more obvious that they're all white, <laughs> and most of them are blonde. And in fact, most of them are even wearing the same clothes. So uh, this is true. <laughs> This is true for most of the, well, I would say 99.9% .9 of the top looks in every challenge. And 
ultimately, because receiving a high score results in getting more prizes and leveling up faster, players are implicitly encouraged to pick only white models. <coughs> But it's not just implicit. Players recognize that this is going on. I've taken a couple of quotes from player forums that are outside of the game. And here you can see somebody who's saying that they experienced their black models just not scoring as well. And they actually switched to playing only white models so that they could increase their score. Another player, interestingly enough, says, um, maybe this is a genuine injustice and prejudice of the world that is shown clearly in the fantasy world of this app. I guess they just did my presentation for me. I could stop now and then, and then you could all go home or go to your next presentation, but I'm not. So back in 2015, when I wrote my trivial essay that a Tumblr guy said uh, I was too worked up about, I, I, decide, I had noticed this in my own gameplay as well. So I decided to do a small quantitative analysis of my own gameplay. And what I did was I alternated black and white models for 40 challenges to see how well each model would score. When I, ca when I calculated their average scores, um, as you can see, my white models perform significantly better. There's a 0.4 difference between the averages between white models and black models. And as you see with the scoring system, over time that really adds up and gives you a significant disadvantage in terms of, of the prize system. I also kept track of which models won in head-to-head -head challenges. So each time a dark skin model was put up against a light skin model, I voted. I always voted for the dark skin model just to keep some kind of consistency and maybe greater justice in the world. But, and then I noted which one had a higher score after voting. Out of 86 instances of this happening, uh, black models only won 31% of the 31 times. So that's... This is kind of the most staggering element of this. Out of 40 challenges that I entered, only one challenge featured a single black model in the top looks. I don't, you, can, you can calculate the average of that. It's like 99.9.999% white models that won. So. so this brings us to recent history. In January, Covet launched an update that they called Modern Covet. And it featured two major changes. The first was the addition of models of different sizes and shapes, larger models, plus size models. And then the second feature was that players could no longer change the skin tone of their models. So in other words, you would enter a challenge and you would get a set model and you could not change anything about that doll's body. This is just to give you a sense of the new range of models and what they looked like. So it would be some combination of each skin tone and body size that you would get for each challenge. Another interesting thing is they changed the facial features. Before, in Classic Covet, there was only one face for everything. And now they added a lot of different facial features that, you know, somewhat reflect different ethnicities. So Covet described this as a celebration of diversity. And... Um, you know, talked about their new bold and beautiful models. And they also implied that this would create, well, they said that this would create new challenges for their players, implying that it's somehow harder to make a fat black woman look beautiful in this game, which I think is incredibly insulting, uh, F for effort, but you tried, Covet. <laughs> and the, the player feedback varied a lot. So these quotes are taken from the Facebook post that announced the update, and this is what players were replying with. This player says that it ruins the fantasy element of the game. She says, I self-identify as an obese woman and I don't want to see fat women in the game that I like to play. There was also a lot of positive feedback. Um, people saying that they really enjoyed the, the new models and their looks. They thought they were beautiful. One commenter actually said, I'm going to tell all my friends who stopped playing that they should come back and play now. But for my purposes, the most interesting and important player feedback was that this notion of choice had been removed. Um, the whole point of Covet, of a game like Covet, is choice. We asked for more choice in the form of plus sizes, and you gave us less by restricting the model's bodies. <laughs> this one is great. Um, hello. I don't like being forced to play a certain way. You should have added the new body types and let us as the players choose how we want to play. Now, on top of all of this, the update had a ton of flaws. So it was... <laughs> It was practically unplayable for several days to a week after the update. Um, it was glitchy. 
and the, the models looked really awkward. I don't just mean like this, but even when they rendered correctly, they still looked awkward. They had very unnatural, angry faces. And as happens so often in the fashion industry, they just stretched the clothes over different bodies. So the cuts and the patterns ended up not looking very flattering. Um, you know, fashion in the real world translates to fashion in the digital world. So what went wrong with the update? Obviously, they rolled it out way too quickly. There were still way too many glitches. There was no incentive for players to stick with Modern Covet because they could switch back to the classic version if they wanted to. So Covet could have easily granted them like some in-game currency packages or a couple of garments or something like that, um, but they didn't. So it didn't seem like they were too invested in keeping players uh, on Modern Covet after the update. And they also did very little uh, promotion prior to the update to get players excited about it they j and, and to give players a sense of what would change. They just sort of plopped it on them one day. But much more importantly, what went wrong with the Covet update is that uh, not only did they never address the racism and the, uh, the way that voting perpetuated that problem, they also never addressed the fact that the same thing would have happened if they had just added plus size models. I mean, it's, you would have still had, now you just would have had skinny white blonde women winning all of the top looks. Um, and there was no formal explanation for this restriction of choice. So Covet really had an opportunity there to have this dialogue with their players and instead they talked about celebrating diversity. So classic Covet still continues to look like this. Um, you can see they're still almost all wearing mostly the same outfits. Here's another really stark example of that. Um, <laughs> celebrating diversity. <laughs> Here's modern Covet, um, which one of the things I found interesting about modern Covet was how different the outfits ended up looking uh, in the top looks. So it really does seem to be more about style uh, since they made the change. There's just one more example of that. So this is all wrapped up in structure and power and this really pervasive ideology of voting as a, as a democratic meritocracy um, that's based in this rhetoric of choice. And my point is that the majority, you know, this majoritarian binary voting model is not democratic in the sense of minority representation and really not democratic in a lot of other ways as well. It essentially just perpetuates a dominant discourse, and in this case is beauty norms of whiteness and thinness and usually blondness. So Covet had an opportunity to address anti-racist, anti-fat bias in voting, but instead it ended up focusing on this rhetoric of inclusion and diversity at the expense of social change and justice. Thank you. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you to Brittany. I really appreciate that. I think that her presentation gives a great foundation um, for what I'll be discussing in my presentation as well. Um, I think I might have the gaudiest PowerPoint of today, so <laughs> here you go. Uh, so what I'm presenting today are excerpts from a much larger project that I'm conducting for my master's thesis, which is a platform-specific discourse analysis on the makeup enthusiast community of Instagram. So overall, I'm focusing on how social media and its users shape, negotiate, and redefine gendered subjectivities and the very concept of feminine beauty. My theoretical framework overall extends from Foucault's notions of power, technologies of the self, and then feminist theorists who have complicated and extended those um, theoretical frameworks. So Instagram, as you all know, has reached phenomenological levels of use, developed in 2010 and then purchased by Facebook in 2012. It now averages over 80 million photo uploads a day. Um, beauty content has become one of the ro most robust interest categories on Instagram. The makeup enthusiast community is rapidly expanding as brands, influencers, makeup artists, and casual users congregate on the platform to offer tutorials, review products, and connect with other users. Shared conversation and imagery around makeup continues to grow rapidly on Instagram. A cursory search reveals 116 million photos tagged makeup, 12.3 million tagged Insta Beauty, 8.5 tagged Beauty Blogger, and millions more under Makeup Addict, Beauty Community, and tags such as that. 
Previously relegated to the private sphere, the application of cosmetics has now obtained a decidedly public presence through social media. This is largely due to the popularization of makeup tutorials starting with YouTube, a phenomenon which has also found fertile ground in Instagram and an even wider audience. The traditionally highly private practice of makeup has become more public and thus the meaning and context of cosmetic practices is evolving and warrants further theorizing as to its role in identity formation and our understandings of gender. Overall, the community serves as a space in which subjects increasingly articulate their identities through market logics and commercial projects and products, um, interpolated to use both Instagram and cosmetic products to create an aesthetic self and a personal brand. However, which is what I'll be focusing on today, the community is simultaneously breaking open new possibilities for visual culture and the field of meaning around gender, beauty, and femininity. One of the most powerful transformations that I've witnessed occurring within Instagram's beauty culture is the potential to displace the male gaze. Through a focus on self-expression, makeup brands and enthusiasts are repositioning the role of makeup. Rather than catering to an ever-present, imagined, white, heterosexual male surveyor, makeup is increasingly about the applicant and user. So, who owns beauty? Western visual culture, as many of us know, has long been oriented toward the male gaze. Initially coined by film theorist Laura Mulvey and elaborated on by numerous other scholars, the male gaze theory articulates the phenomenon in which women are perceived and assessed primarily in how they are sexually viewed and consumed by men. In visual culture studies, the gaze is understood as a field of meaning production through which power and agency are exercised and established. In all, feminine beauty has been constructed as something to be consumed, possessed, and policed by male subjects. It has been a woman's duty to ensure physical attractiveness in order to signal worth and femininity, but paradoxically, women are condemned for this very pursuit of beauty through accusations of frivolity, vanity, or even deceitfulness. However, what we're seeing happen in Instagram's beauty community is the creation of a new narrative around makeup, and they counter the notion that everything is or ought to be directed toward a male observer. Through memes, comments, and captions, makeup enthusiasts proactively dismiss the male perspective. Um, so for example, this middle photo is referencing a very common makeup shaming meme in which there's a juxtaposed photo of a woman with and without makeup with the caption, take her swimming on the first date. Presumably this is to reveal her true face before engaging in any sort of romantic or sexual relationship. Uh, attesting to the overarching attitude of this emerging cosmetic culture, take her swimming on the first date has now been appropriated as a tongue-in-cheek expression by many makeup artists and lovers. Many highly shared memes express complete exasperation at men asserting their opinion about women's self-styling choices. For example, hanging up on a man who is asserting that he, you should go for a natural look, or assuming that men are stupid enough to think that you have gold or sparkly eyelets. <laughs> Prominent influencers also take time to speak to the issue of being shamed for wearing makeup. Addressing her frustration with the assumption that she wears makeup to please men, Nikki Tutorials, who has over 7 million followers on Instagram and got her start on YouTube, posted the following on her Instagram, getting over 200,000 likes and 3,000 comments. The reposted meme reads, I'm not sh sitting out here blending my crease to filth and carving my brows into a weapon to get approval from a guy. And she furthers the message of the meme in the caption saying, listen up boys, we don't wear makeup to please you. This declaration moves away from passive language um, and instead uses technical, even aggressive language that positions the makeup user as the central agent with little or no concern for the male observer. The comment section also highlights the resonance of this message. Amidst thousands of yas, queen, amen, and the enthusiastic tagging of friends, comments Commenters overwhelmingly agreed with the sentiment, saying that they used makeup because they wanted to for personal entertainment or artistic motivations. And if we look at my favorite common exchange down here, we have Rachel Witchie saying, what do you do if your boyfriend hates makeup? To which Plum MLN responds, get a new boyfriend. So if the male observer does assume that his opinion on makeup reigns, consensus is he should be dumped. <laughs> 
In all, this dominant focus on self-expression as the guiding force behind makeup per, uh, pushes the male gaze to the periphery. In accordance with the neoliberal, individualistic, self-expression ethos that dominates our current culture and social media, the purpose of makeup is consistently framed as an individual decision that is intended to achieve a level of personal fulfillment. Within the makeup enthusiast community on Instagram, um, we are witnessing the steady unseating of the male observer. Users are continually centering the femme subject as agent rather than the passive observed object. This generalized resistance to the male gaze in femme created media is ushering in a radical change in the visual culture surrounding the concept of feminine beauty. Through a celebration of skill, declaration of choice, and the dismissal of a male gaze, women and femmes are situating beauty within their realm of agency and creating new narratives. Just as the discursive framing of makeup is changing, so are the very visual representations of what constitutes beauty. The faces of Instagram's makeup enthusiast community serve to both maintain and disrupt traditional hegemonic beauty standards. So a very distinct look has emerged on the platform, often referred to as Instagram face or Instagram makeup. There becomes an established grammar of beauty through this content, which as you see here is defined by bold and precise brows, wide dramatic eyes, a narrow nose, hollow cheeks achieved by contouring, and very uh, significant highlighter. So through this, we then have a distinct grammar of beauty content that makes it then significantly both recognizable and reproducible as beauty. The platform-specific grammar of beauty provides the scaffolding for the mimetic circulation of beauty across Instagram. So here, this grid of uncannily similar faces are screenshots that I sourced from the 19 influencers dubbed by the outlet Fashionista as the top beauty Instagrammers of 2016. I also added in Kim Kardashian, who's often cited as the visual referent for this Instagram makeup look. So overall, despite the seemingly individualistic, democratic, and diverse ethos of both Instagram as a platform and the makeup enthusiast community, the incessant circulation of this ideal face in many ways reifies narrow, white, Eurocentric beauty standards and creates a near impossible standard that cannot be achieved without extensive labor and editing through Photoshop and cosmetics. The uncanny resemblance of these faces reveals how Instagram face is characterized by a quality Walter Benjamin refers to as being designed for reproducibility. The ideal face essentially circulates as a meme on Instagram. I contend, though, that there's destabilizing potential in this reproducibility and mimicry. As Judith Butler writes, there may be something about enacting a norm that holds within it the possibility for non-compliance. So even if uncalculated, the groundswell of this Instagram face imagery may in fact serve to counter or subvert beauty standards that rely on an essentialized notion of femininity. It's also worth noting that this face is extremely similar to the faces in the Covet beauty game, a very similar like contouring and structuring of the faces. So it's a cross-platform phenomenon as well. So for example, in this list of top influencers, three self-identify as men. There's Mac Daddy with the beard, um, Gabriel Zamora with the blue hair, and James Charles with the backwards hat, who's a whole other meme and problematic figure we can discuss at a later time. <laughs> um, so by Leveraging and adopting these established norms of feminine beauty, these men are able to assume this look of feminine beauty and become widely acknowledged as, as figures of beauty within this culture. So I argue that the heavily and obviously made up look of this Instagram face disrupts the idea of a naturalized or essentialized feminine beauty. The mimetic quality of popular makeup looks Op opens up a space for repetition, and with this repetition comes the possibility for modification, subversion, and non-compliance. The destabilizing potential is, is evidenced through the increased diversity of faces featured on mainstream makeup accounts. Of the top 10 most followed makeup brands on Instagram, which have a combined following of over 118 million followers, all 10 have featured a man in a full face of makeup in the past six months, and six have featured a hijabi in the past six months. This is a drastic escalation in the visibility of these populations within this visual culture. Men in makeup and Muslim women have historically been entirely excluded from mainstream Western representation 
indications of beauty. It's also important to note that nearly all of these brands are directly partnering with or featuring the content creators and makeup artists themselves. This then elevates and acknowledges those who are creating the beauty culture of Instagram rather than merely appropriating without credit or using as props of exoticized otherness. This stands in notable contrast to a long and certainly continuing history of appropriation within beauty culture. The mimetic quality of beauty looks on Instagram seems to open up the potential for repetition from a wider variety of faces, so people are able to apply an established look, grammar, and aesthetic to a beauty and gain recognition. Excessive repetition highlights skill and technique, and therefore an appreciation of what an idea of good makeup can be on a variety of faces. Attesting to a shift of sentiment, if you look at the comment sections of any of these features on brands, which often are riddled with a lot of debate and questioning over the rightness of focusing on these people, um, there's a the discussion that makeup is genderless. So recognizing the inconsistent and paradoxical powers at work, my research strives to acknowledge the problematic reification of dominant neoliberal logics and values while also legitimating the powerful subversion occurring within this space, which is destabilizing conceptions of feminine beauty and disrupting patriarchal norms. Within this contradictory and highly commercialized terrain, it is evident that many are still able to inhabit, rework, and appropriate governing forces of beauty culture for their own ends. Hello, um, I am also talking about Instagram and my presentation is called Self-Made Supermodels and it's a condensed version of an article that I wrote for Rhizome published in September. In early 2015, near the end of my MFA in Fine Arts at Parsons, I set out on a project to create a celebrity by 2020, entirely via the internet as an intentional art practice. The celebrity I came to create was a hyper-sexy, cyber-savvy female rock star named Ona. Without a large budget or industry connections, I knew that major social media growth would be an important factor. I tried some tactics I'd used in the past, such as open submissions and press releases, and not much came of it. I DM'd a number of pages asking for advice, and finally I DM'd a collection page, which is a page with a large follower account that features photos of various models, and it got back to me. The page was the butt blog, and I was told it would cost $200 for a permanent post. I paid its admin to post a photo of me, and in 24 hours I gained around 5,000 real followers. This opened my circle to the Instagram collection world and marked the beginning of my transformation into an Instagram model. Instagram has emerged as a big player in the modeling world with many different types of models on the platform. Models create Instagram pages to showcase their work, gain followers, and amass cultural and economic power. And while many industry models or agency models, models who are signed with modeling agencies, have large Instagrams, that IG model differs from these in that she builds her following on the IG platform without industry support. For more than a year, I've immersed myself in the culture and economics of Instagram modeling. By paying careful attention to other users and applying their approaches to myself, I came to understand that becoming an Instagram model involved engaging in a host of specific practices on Instagram and off. By adopting these practices, I've been able to develop my own profile as an Instagram model to over 550,000 real followers, and I've monetized my IG through a pay site that I built using all the pics I can't put on IG. Mainstream media favors agency models and celebrity users well over IG models. Riffing off something I mentioned in BodyAnxiety.com, an online art show I curated in 2015, this could be seen as a further iteration of man hands. Man hands. Because agency models have been sanctioned by a system and because they are frequently photographed by acclaimed photographers, because they have been crafted by man hands and do not need to craft themselves, they are seen as more respectable than their non-legitimate independent counterpart, the IG model. The IG model is in fact far more entrepreneurial, in control of her image, and infused with free agency as she runs her own art practice 
largest tech startup brand marketing IG page like a business performance amalgam, like so many artists today. And admittedly, because of our need to try harder, I personally find our presentation more compelling than when an agency model and celebrity users do on IG. The IG model is highly skilled at shaping her own image and at monetizing the emotional labor of dealing with the expectations and attentions of usually male fans. Um, so this is a celebrity user. So an IG model is not a social user nor a product user. She's also not a celebrity user. Celebrity users get most of their followers by being featured in mainstream media, not by promoting themselves through the Instagram platform itself. So one way to assess how the difference between industry models who are celebrity user, users and IG models is to compare Emrata, a celebrity agency model with currently 12 million followers, and Sarah Underwood, an IG model with 7 million followers. The two actually have a history together and show some similarities, as they and they did a barbecue best pair commercial together in 2013. The current use of their Instagram pages nicely illustrates the difference between the IG profiles of an agency model and an IG model. While the two have been, are, have been in the past comparable in terms of followers, a deeper look at their pages shows that Sarah Underwood showcases her bikini-clad body in almost every photo, while Emrata sports a bikini in a third of her photos, fashionable wear in another third, and features landscapes, foods, interiors, and family photos in the other third. If Sarah Underwood posts a photo she's not in, it's probably an advertisement she has been paid to post. Unlike industry models, being as explicit as one can be while staying within Instagram's community guidelines is part of the IG model art form. For instance, is extremely rare to hear of an IG model supporting free the nipple, since in a sense, the censorship of the nipple is part of what gives the creative IG model her power. How, how sexy can she get without getting naked? Or how can she charge to free the nipple? It also helps keep her work technically safe for work and prevents society from throwing the word erotic or porn in front of model when describing her, which is good since they are not known for getting lots of brand endorsements from mainstream products. Because her body type is often not what modeling agencies look for, too short, too curvy, too big, too old, too non-industry standard facial features etc., her post may attempt to turn this into a positive by highlighting her unique physical assets or features, such as large tits, round ass, etc. Further, her poses are often far more sexual than models who are signed with modeling agencies or the average female IG user. The IG model is a high level of activity on her page, likes and comments, and she herself interacts with her followers. Unless she is a fit model, her fan base is often predominantly straight men, and she often presents herself as single. As far as I can tell, the high rate of fit male fans that IG models have is an important difference between them and celebrity users. A quick look at some of the top female celebrity users, like Beyonce and Kim Kardashian, shows they have a significantly more female likers than male likers on their posts, while the IG model generally has around the opposite ratio. This would seem to imply that being appeal appealing to to a female audience is a major precondition to being embraced by the mainstream media as a celebrity, while those who mainly appeal to a male audience are largely ignored probably because they are considered unacceptably pornographic. The IG model gains followers without the help of mainstream media, and her social media process is often exclusively on Instagram. To earn these followers, most IG models engage in some level of SFS, spam for spam, which generally involves cross-promotion of some pa kind between two pages. She is frequently tagged in other people's pages, collection pages, and photographer pages. She is often openly engaged in the promotion of either her own or others' products and services. She often makes money off her own products and or off SFS, and money goes directly to her as opposed to a modeling agency or third party, and she may also make money from camming or other kinds of paid arrangements with followers. Sorry, I had to skip over some because I don't have time. But through their posts, IG models engage in a particular performative self-presentation using a variety of features and signifiers. They'll usually pick a performance style and stick with it to build their individual brand and establish a community of collection pages and potential communities to collaborate or SFS with. Each has a different aesthetic parameters, characteristics, goals, and ways to grow traffic. Within IG, there are a variety of looks. Um, some of which I'll look at below. Part of deciding on a performance style is choosing which cheeks to feature. In other words, models on IG can generally choose to posi position themselves as face, tits, or ass girls. These categories aren't hard and fast, um, but they are bound up in questions about status and following as well as body type. Face girls are usually not IG models, according to my definition, but are instead celebrity users or industry models. For face girls, most of their growth is due to external to IG growth mechanisms, magazines, major blogs, and so on. 
Tit girls choose to highlight tits, caref carefully obscuring the nipple and face. Many of the highly popular IG models seem to have breast implants. Some t tit girls openly share and discuss on Snapchat or Instagram that their tits are, quote, fake. Women who have had breast implants are often very successful as IG models and do a large number of brand endorsements. They may endorse supplements, te teeth whitening products, clothing stores, or any product for that matter. Another tit girl, Fit Tea, is very popular. Um, in terms of social status, ass girls are the lowest. They don't have agency representation like face girls and aren't as prime for product endorsement or safe as tit girls. Part of this is because ass girls like Taz Angel shows a lot of their behind from side, back, or below, usually though sometimes without panties. This makes their posts more frankly sexual and less easy to pass off as wholesome and brand friendly. Nevertheless, these models have a special niche on IG as there are collection pages that feature them and there is a particularly high level of skill involved with presenting the ass creatively. In general, IG models have more diverse body types than traditional agency models. The thick girl can be hugely popular in a way she can't be as a fashion model. Also, height doesn't matter on IG, just proportions. In this way, IG so fosters more diverse body types than are seen in traditional modeling. But due to the urge for and competitiveness of growth, it also rewards extremes, as in bigger tits or ass. Since nudity is not allowed, IG innovative ways to cover up and be nude without actually being nude are part of the IG game. Uh, IG model accounts are regularly deleted for a variety of reasons. In order to have your account reinstated, you need to submit an appeal through an IG form you receive when the account is suspended. My account was deleted once from IG, and the email said it was because my page was sexually suggestive, even though the IG community guidelines don't use that phrase. From what I've seen, most IG models are reinstated after deletion, as long as they aren't flagr flagrantly breaking the rules. However, collection pages that post ask girls are fairly often permanently deleted. Did I mention that I'm an ass girl? I'll spare you the screen cap. This ultimately means that on collection pages, tits can be posted from any angle, but ass may only be posted from a conservative or socially appropriate angle. And therefore, large tit girl pages tend to grow more and be the bigger pages than ass girl pages. Um, ultimately, I believe that what some IG models are doing deserves the name art for several reasons. First, the work has at least two socio-critical components. One, it proposes that engage it, it proposes that engaging the male gaze can be seen as female empowering as resisting it. And two, in self-making themselves as supermodels, they are subverting the traditional power structure of the female image machine and ushering in a new era of woman-made woman. -made woman. Second, like many artists before them, they strive to depict the beautiful aspects of nature, and like various artists online, they inspire discourse about the complicated discrepancies between digitality and reality, art and commerce, sociality and agency. Um, I recently created a show of IG models whose work I found particularly artistically, in artistically interesting at newmatriarchs.com. But perhaps the best reason for IG models to be considered art is that in a sense they are not models. In the production of artworks, the model is something that inspires an artist to make art. For example, a model sitting for Picasso or that forms the physical basis of a piece of art but is not considered art itself. For instance, a model appearing in a photo by Helmut Newton. In other words, IG models have freed themselves of man hands. They have agency over their performances and they themselves make up the art. They do the work, appear in the work, get recognized for the work, and often get paid for the work. So they are the work. Whether or not the IG model will find cultural respect outside of IG remains unclear. She is as much a challenge to the art world as she is to the commercial modeling world. The former is likely to consider her too commercial, sexual to be art, while the latter considers her too artistic, independent, explicit to be commercial. Walking this line and causing cognitive distance di and causing cognitive dissonance in two separate and often opposed major cultural spheres must be counted as one of the IG models more remarkable achievements and there are undoubtedly more to come. Thank you. I'll start with a quote. 
Male fantasies, male fantasies. Is everything run by male fantasies? Up on a pedestal or down on your knees, it is all a male fantasy. That you are strong enough to take what they dish out, or else too weak to do anything about it. Even pretending you aren't catering to male fantasies is a male fantasy. <laughs> pretending you're unseen. Pretending you have a life of your own. That you can wash your feet and comb your hair unconscious of the ever-present watcher peering through the keyhole. Peering through the keyhole in your own head, if nowhere else. You are a woman with a man inside, watching a woman. You are your own voyeur. Hi, my name is Sofia. I study movie and theater sciences in Berlin. Um, first of all, I of course would like to thank uh, the organizers for making this event possible. I'm truly honored to be here and to be on a panel with such inspiring people. Um, as I was reading this quote, I didn't really get a chance to look at the reaction in your faces. Um, I can imagine that some of you have been amused, maybe uh, um, pleased by the eloquence of uh, Atwood's, uh, uh, yeah, of Atwood's uh, poems. Um, I can also imagine that some of you have been slightly annoyed or maybe bored. For every one of us who spends time on social media, and I believe it's uh, everyone in this room, uh, can't not have noticed uh, popular news coverage's recent obsession with the so-called um, male gaze. Um, in fact, all those... <sighs> Sorry. Uh, from magazines like Dazed and Confused and Vice, have you heard about the uh, lingerie that subverts the male gaze? Uh, we heard about the music videos that challenge the male gaze. Or we, of course, carefully read the elaborations on why the nude selfie is a feminist statement. Um, all those articles are, in fact, based, and uh, Sarah already addressed that, on, um, on Freud's and Lacan's concepts of scopophilia, of Schaulust, and um, their condemnation within feminist theory uh, in the 70s. Um, the recent reemergence of those psychoanalytical concepts gave birth to a number of new phenomena within the world of female representations. We witnessed so-called no-filter, no-photoshop feminists that rejected the digital manipulation of images on the grounds that it is inscribing patriarchal beauty norms into the female body. And um, this discourse is, by the way, still very active, um, still very alive when we look at the um, when we look at articles treating Melania Trump's pre presidential portrait, we were introduced to so-called selfie feminists that turned the phallic objective onto themselves. And by doing so, supposedly returned the patriarchic gaze back to the woman. And we've seen attempts to avoid normative patriarchi patriarchal expectations by favoring the depiction of bodies that refuse, refute and redirect ideology. I just quoted Arya Dean's article, Closing the Loop, in which she addresses, um, in which she addresses Shawnee Michel Michelle Holloway's uh, photography. What I want to address in my uh, little talk is a few major flaws I perceived within the discourse, not the actual visual products themselves, but within the discourse that evolved around those projects, uh, um, around those objects. Um, they can be best summed up in three points. The hermeneutical methodology that is used to evaluate those visual products. The misconception of the photograph as being able to depict political discourse. And the optimism accorded to the actual motive and mode of depiction. Uh, let's just start from the bottom. Uh, reading the aforementioned articles, I still have the feeling that a lot of people um, uh, conceive of photography as being this innocent act of innocent act of documenting reality and the photograph itself of being a naive object of depiction. But if we dig just a tiny bit into photographic theory, we realize that um, the act of taking a photograph has very early been seen as an act of aestheticizing and idealizing the subject of depiction. Um, we can quote, for example, Susan Sontag from her essay in Plato's Cave. Images which idealize are no less aggressive than work that makes a virtue out of plainness. There is an aggression implicit in every use of the camera. Thus, the act of taking a photograph, no matter if it's fashion or documentary photography, is always the aggressive act of imposing one's own aesthetical ideas on the object. 
Those qualities taken into account. Does it matter if the image has been additionally digitally modified by software like Photoshop? I would argue it doesn't because the photograph itself already uh, it represents the aesthetic vision of the photographer and I don't see why unretouched images should be more should be a more emancipative value than their uh, retouched sisters. And now returning to the objectifying qualities that are also addressed in this quote. Does it matter if the subject depicted is abled or disabled, black or white, queer or straight? I would argue it doesn't, for in the medium of photography the depicted object is always turned into a metonymy that can be symbolically possessed. It always represents an aggressive gesture, and this gesture does not bear an emancipative op and, and this gesture does not bear emancipative opportunities for the depicted object. Now I already sense the question that uh, follows what I just said. What if this object objectification didn't, uh, wasn't perform performed by an external force, but by the depicted object itself? Um, if we look in a bit closer into psychoanalytical theory, um, we, uh, yeah, we can understand why this is a wrong conception. Assigned the place of object, the woman is the recipient of male desire. Her sexual pleasure can thus only be constructed around her own objectification. Thus internalizing the male gaze doesn't represent a subversion of Freud's and Lacan's theories. It is rather a subdomain of those theories. And um, I always wonder when I read those articles in Dazed, in Dazed and Confused and Vice, if the, if the authors that are addressing those theories actually ever read them. Good. Um, moving on to the next point. It is, um, in many articles, it is common sense to consider uh, some uh, pictures as political and some pictures as unpolitical. And uh, it is useful to draw from Willem Flusser's media theory to understand why this is a very, very huge paradox. The ideal was that there is history and that and there is a photographer. And when he steps back from history into something which we might call mystical transcendence, a photograph emerges. But there is a problem. The moment you step back from history into something we might call mystical transcendence, the political point of view is lost because every event has many possible points of view. Consequently, the photograph showing only one point of view is by its very nature irreconcilable with, uh, by its essence, irreconcilable with the nature of political discourse. ...are like heralded as this big feminist triumph <laughs> in lieu of actual political participation that there certainly does need to be a displacing of some of those things. So whether it's removing body hair or a facial or whatever, those things in them th themselves you know, in commodity feminism, sometimes get pinpointed as an act of political resistance. And I think it's about looking at those things and not dismissing them as mere obedience or surrendering to the powers that be, but then also placing them in like a context and a healthy community of people like working together to create new understandings of gender and things, but together in a way that's like beyond just the individual. Yeah. That was very good. Um, I just want to say I have one chin hair that grows right here. <laughs> <laughs> it gets really long and I forget about it and I spent all morning feeling it and trying to pluck it out and I did so thank you for the congratulatory yeah no it's not a big I'm no hero okay I pluck my chin hairs out just like any other person um, so I, I I do have from an academic perspective I can't help but think of Judith Butler and her talk about the you know she essentially says gender is the repetition of um, you know certain gendered acts and that relates both at an individual level and a structured level. She looks at what kinds of repetitions can disrupt this compulsory heterosexual matrix. She talks about drag. Um, and I, I, so I'm a person who swings wildly between femme and not like a masculine aesthetic, but just a not femme aesthetic, like going outside in really baggy pants and a uh, flannel that doesn't have hardly any buttons left on it and uh, no makeup or smeared makeup all over. And um, I, I think that it's a kind of a strange place to live in when you disrupt that identity on a daily basis just for yourself. And then the last reflection I have on it is that I also uh, have been a bartender for many years. And so your presentation is part of your profession. Like you... Uh, 
I, one day I went in with very minimal makeup on and everybody kept asking me if I was sick. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus, man, all right, I'm never doing this again. So, so having an extremely femme presentation that's very clean, that's very well made up, that is highly groomed, and especially working a day shift and having a lot of older male customers is essentially, this is kind of messed up, but it's a mode of extracting resources from a clientele that is essentially there to look at a pretty girl and talk to her and get drunk. Is that liberatory? I don't know, capitalism is complicated. But um, it's untaxed income that I wouldn't get if I didn't you know, present very femme and, and as problematic as that is, uh, we do what we can. That's it. So who wants, first question from the room. I don't think this is gonna stretch. Why don't you guys just keep it up there to answer. Anybody? Yeah. Um, I have a question for Sophia. Mm -hmm. Could you give an example of how uh, the, the formal critique that you're advocating for would work? Oh, I, um, you mean uh, like a step-by-step -step instruction or? Not necessarily, but just like an illustration of when you Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, I think it would not it's really. For the live oh, so, I'm sorry. It's just for the live stream. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I um, I have elaborated on elaborated on that in my essay because I advance the GIF as uh, the the GIF or the GIF. I don't know how, how you call it here. Um, as a, as a format that is cap uh, capable of um, representing more complex forms of identity, and at the same time, uh, you know, um, of an identity that is uh, less stable. Uh, Etc. And I have elaborated on that in my essay, but I just think that it will not overlap with what all uh, my other co-panelists co talked about. So, if we can we can talk about it after it, if you want to. Yeah. Um, is the economic agency of the face, tit, and ass girls uh, on Instagram somewhat related to like the uniqueness, like having a unique face as being more valuable in that sort of sense? Can you repeat the question if you like? Oh. Is the economic agency of face, tits, and ass girls linked to uniqueness? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure. <laughs> That's a very good question. I mean, I think with the face girls, since they are really just selected through the mainstream media and modeling agencies and sort of production companies, they have sort of their own ways that they pick faces. And I'm not sure you might have more opinions on faces. Um, Regarding the tits and ass, I think that there is uniqueness in the creativity and sort of each each performer finding a niche that maybe works really well for them or trying to do it in a different way. Like particular photos will be picked up and go all over if it's a particularly great photo. Um, but then there is something to it all looking at also being all looking the same. So um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I have, I, have an, I have some thoughts on at least, yeah, on the face side. I think um, one concept that's helpful to, that I found helpful for navigating these online spaces and beauty standards is the idea of legitimate difference. So essentially that there's like a certain mold that you have to fit in with a certain look. So whether that's like a curviness, but then you can have something else that's a little bit different about you or in the makeup community that you still can like replicate a certain cat eye with precision, but perhaps you are male identifying, right? So that you still exist within these structures of established norms, but then you can deviate in like a small way, but you can't deviate on like multiple points. Yeah. You can deviate on smaller points that then become interesting and help you gain traction, but you still have to be legible as beautiful through like pre-established norms. So I think it's yeah, a mix like, of yeah, uniqueness yeah, exactly. and yeah. like adhering to the same yeah. standards. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of have a question regarding, you started your presentation with like man hands that was like sculpting an image and it had a different kind of currency and you kind of end on like this idea of like male gaze that these IG models have. Is there like any sort of like more that tension going on? I think the, the difference is that the, uh, 
the man hands are about the producers, so like the photographer or the artist um, who is photographing or the um, agency. Uh, so they're the ones who are creating, but they're actually fairly invisible in a way, or they're maybe so societally respected, or they have very impressive power, but the hands are they're somewhat invisible. Um, the male fandom is much more visible, and um, on Instagram in particular, and the sort of point is is that the the model can uh, achieve independence from these other mainstream man hand uh, institutions through actually male fandom. So, and them enabling her ability to perform on her own terms without being restricted to sort of the performative bandwidth of mainstream media performance, female performance. Does that address it? It's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I apologize in advance for what is going to be an extremely pessimistic question, um, but um, I wanted to kind of go back to this idea of diversity and covet and also um, within this um, like sponsored uh, Instagram face, uh, makeup thing. Uh, I don't know what the language is there, sorry. Um, but I wonder um, if this um, kind of move towards more diversity within these realms is kind of like a marketing strategy, basically. Like, I particularly think about this in relationship to, like, men who are wearing makeup mm -hmm. and how that's, like, a huge market share that is not currently, you know, supporting Maybelline, for mm -hmm. example. Um, <laughs> And so I wonder, I mean, like, I understand, of course, diversity is important, and it is very exciting to see different people represented in these ways that they never happen, and in these realms that they never happen, but also, like, how do you deal with this issue that they're just, like, trying to make more people buy stuff? Yeah, so in the case of Covet, I mean, it's obviously the very best players are the players who spend the most money in the game, right? Um, and if you go through and look at the, the top looks, these white blonde models who always win so much stuff, uh, they're wearing the most expensive clothing in the game, and I mean by that, like, in-game currency. But it's also the clothing is real. It is, like, clo like clothing and accessories and shoes and bags that you can buy um, IRL, and it links directly to places that you can buy that. And I think specifically with... Um, covet modern covet diversifying covet that is a you you can see how much that is a marketing move not only to get more people to download the app and then spend money within the app but the fact that they kept classic covet is i think key here because it allowed players to reject this new model of you know so-called diversity and inclusion and just go back to their whites only space while still so they're tapping into a new market that's interested in more um, you know, in, in fat black bodies and, you know, medium size, like Indian, you know, Indian models. And at the same time, uh, maintain their old, I mean, honestly, at this point, I don't mean to make like too strong of a judgment, but if you haven't moved over to modern covet, you're kind of, you're just not interested in disrupting white supremacy. I, in my humble opinion, feel free to disagree with me, but, um, so yeah, they, so they get the best of both worlds and that is obviously a marketing strategy and and also you can tell by the way they handled it that they weren't interested in actually addressing structural problems they were only addressing they were only introducing a new rhetoric that would get them more users so yeah specifically um with the discussion of essentially like right doubling the market share of who's interested in makeup by introducing male makeup users that's a huge part of it so as i mentioned my excerpts here were like a much smaller part of broader what I'm doing for my thesis. So a lot of my thesis is specifically looking at that fusion of personal and commercial and how commercial logics have kind of subsumed and absorbed like pretty much everything um, in like the social media age. And so I think that there's definitely something to be said. I would say that my project started off mostly with that really pessimistic view and I still hold that in a lot of ways. But I think that there's still important fissures that are breaking in that. So yes, you're marketing makeup to a broader range of people through the inclusion of men in full faces of makeup. But at the same time, that's disrupting, I think, the understanding of makeup as necessity for an essentialized performance of femininity. So there's still 
fissures and disruptions happening, even though, of course, like it's also accelerating hyper consumerism. And that's something that certainly needs to be held in the other hand as we're discussing the possibility for increasing diversity and restructuring identities through like mainstream advertising. In terms of like beauty and appearance on Instagram and the kind of ideals that um, all these people are replicating and all these people are um, maybe capitalizing on, I as a black woman who loves makeup and loves beauty, I find and I've often, or for a while I've noticed this, these trends becoming to, being embraced such as like overlining the lips and such as, you know, um, um, you know, just like thicker, or like even putting freckles on, like capitalizing on other people's like features that um, maybe they don't have. Like, how do you see how do you see that capitalization affecting maybe the others, or like how do you see opportunities for like how can we bring? Sorry, I'm like having these thoughts in my head, so I'm trying to congest them. But in general, like where do you see the direction for those who? <laughs> Other, where do you see that the trajectory for them as other like let's say like the Kim Kardashians or the um, not even that or like the makeup Shayla's um, just like taking on these features and kind of utilizing them on their own platforms while the others are pushed down further and not represented as well. Uh, I'll just give my short one where I see like the promise for doing that is through partnering with content creators and makeup artists who are people of color, right? Rather than traditionally in these more mainstream spaces, certain features being adopted as an aesthetic or certain features being adopted simply through makeup. I do think that there is, um, hopefully from what I've been seeing by looking at like specifically Instagram makeup community for about a year, there's a trajectory towards rather than merely appropriating as empty signifier certain like features of black femininity etc that there's actual more incorporation of those who write in an embodied sense have these have these features so I think through versus like hiring models and then applying an aesthetic of black womanhood on white models there's increasingly the incorporation of women and men who themselves are like living in those bodies and creating those makeup looks so I mean that's the only promise I see of doing that, but that's a huge issue with um, the aesthetics of emerging makeup looks is a lot of times picking and choosing and disembodying certain um, features from other people. There's a question on this side of the room. I don't want to accidentally ignore. Okay, back to this side of the room. <laughs> Front row. Um. So I think we're talking about a really important thing today, like this, like disruption and getting agency through mediums like Instagram. But I think it's really important to acknowledge, like, who is allowed to intellectualize their practice, who is allowed to make art, and who is allowed to be on a panel and say that, like, I'm an ass girl, which is like a really cool thing to do. But can a black girl be up here and say that and be respected? And I think it's really important to think about. Um, the platforms that we're using and like the language that we're using and how it's inaccessible to you know privileged people first and foremost um, and what how so how can we you know especially since we're talking about Instagram like the like least academic thing you could be doing and yet we're still like seeing this sort of like hierarchy happening so what are the spaces we can invest to like discuss this and what is the language we can use to discuss these issues so I'm thinking maybe memes maybe like Twitter like how do you see these discussions Discussions happening in ways that are accessible and inclusive. So, uh, I I want to. I made my presentation. I tried really really hard to leave out like a lot of jargon, which is um, easy for me to do because I don't know a lot of academic jargon. I guess. <laughs> um, but I think one really important way that academics who are engaging in this kind of work can do that work is through blogging and writing for a popular publication. And I probably say that because I'm a blogger who writes for popular publication. <laughs> but uh, when I wrote about Covet originally, um, it was being shared by all kinds of 
people from all kinds of backgrounds. I mean, teenagers on Tumblr who obviously have never read Judith Butler, even though I cite Judith Butler in it, I just then go on to give all, you know, I cite it really quickly and then I explain what it is and then I move on. And I think that it's like so, so, so important for people who are um, engaging in these kinds of everyday spaces and platforms of power to make sure that they can do something to translate that to somebody who it will be meaningful for them in a, in a new way make it meaningful for somebody who uses Instagram in an entirely new way they've never thought about it that before that way before and you know not to like toot my own horn but I saw that when I wrote about Covet and I've seen that in my other writing I think right now it's easier than ever for academics to engage with the public in that way and it is free labor that academia does not appreciate and I totally understand that there are also privileged dynamics there as well who can afford to spend free time unpaid time blogging about crap like only some people but nonetheless I will say I think that's at least one mode not the only mode but one way of dealing with that problem yeah, I think adapting uh, like ideas and understanding the context and spaces that you're in. So I would assume that each of us kind of have a different spiel about what we're studying based on the spaces. But I think particularly internet affordances like memes and blogs and forums become really important spaces for kind of dissecting and understanding what that looks like as a collective versus I'm the privileged person that has expertise on this. So let me tell you as an academic what's happening in this space. Um, I think that's an important movement for academia and theorizing to be doing as a whole is right moving beyond that ivory tower space of let me tell you what you peasants on social media are doing from my perspective. Um, yeah, so finding ways to actually have it more like a collective in producing theory and in discussing theory and figuring out ways to discuss it that doesn't have so many barriers through language. We probably have time for one more question. What's the last question? Um, okay, um, I'm curious about the makeup uh, scenario in which women are saying like, oh, dump your boyfriend if he's not interested in the makeup. Um, and because makeup has this like I think dual identity of either being for sexual attractiveness or for self-esteem um, that the Instagram sort of creates the world of self-esteem versus the world of okay I'm gonna actually go actively find someone attractive to attract <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that yeah um, so I think actually to connect it to what Sylvia was talking about about the idea of focusing on um, not just necessarily content but form I think the affordances of Instagram as a platform then construct an entirely different way of sharing images and discussing so I think a lot of times the discourse that's emerged um, is like like I showed through comment sections and memes so sort of more bottom up than top down and then marketing as it always does then like incorporates that language in and of itself of what it's doing um, but I think there's definitely that tension and I think a lot of it is due to discussing the idea of discourse and theory becoming more accessible like a lot of Tumblr discussion of like gender, like that's been a real big place where people have been rediscovering and redefining gender and identity. I think that flows cross platform. And so I think that that has almost made it um, like you would be looked down on if you were like, I wear makeup for men, right? Even if you do, it's sort of almost like swung the opposite way where advertisers and influencers, anyone posting has to be like, I do this very much for me, which has to do with a lot of what feminism or the permutations of what feminism is today and what commodity feminism is like kind of holds up right where it's like it all has to be for you at the end of the day and I think that has promising potential but also it's l severe limitations as well It actually is. 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 It actually is.